Okay, everyone, welcome to this um, Building Tidal Models from Scratch webinar. I'll just share my screen and we can get going. So today's session is meant to be an interactive session, so coding as we go. Can everyone see my screen, first of all, just before we get kicked off? Take that as a yes. Can we all see? Yeah, I see it. Cool. Right. So what we're going to aim to do today is build two tidy models models. Um, essentially, we're going to start with a baseline model, so a simple logistic regression model. And then we're going to essentially build another model on top of that, which will be an XG boost model. And I'll teach you a couple of the tricks of um, some of the issues that you might encounter along the way when you come to building machine learning classification models. Um, I've done another webinar on how you use Carrot to build regression and classification models, and I'll link all those later on when I give you access to the, uh, the full materials for this, this course. So let's all get our clouds, cloud accounts open or your local version of RStudio, and let's get started. So you should have this um, TM from scratch student um, markdown file. Can I just confirm that everyone's got that before we get going? Excellent. Excellent. It's looking good. We've got eight thumbs up so far, or one's just gone down. Yeah, looking good. Right. Okay. So we'll get started. And can everyone see my screen? Does it look good? Do I need to zoom in slightly? I can do that a little bit more. Is that too big now? Okay, we'll keep it there. Right, so first of all, we're going to load in all our imports. And we actually need to add one. And apologies that I didn't put this on the prep, so you might need to install this. But we need to add XG Boost as well as a modeling framework that we're going to be using throughout this tutorial. So if you haven't got that, go to Packages, Install, XG Boost, and just hit Install, and that'll run the inst installation process for you while we get going. Okay, so I'm gonna bring in all my imports first of all. So we're gonna be working with a couple of packages today for machine learning. So there's the ML data package, which is a series of collated uh, machine learning data sets that are gonna be relatively useful. Confusion table also, we wanna, we're gonna to wanna to collapse down the confusion table outputs that we get from our classification models into a tabular record format. We're gonna bring in tidy models because that's the main driving package we're going to be working with today. Dplyr, ggplot, per, gg themes, just for adding different chart styles, model data, um, MLOps package, which is relatively new, called Vetiver, and XGBoost. So if I run all these, that should complete for you. So the first thing we're going to need to do, and this will start typing along. I've prepared these in your room markdown tutorials thus far. The first thing we're going to do is bring in the thyroid disease data set. So essentially today we're going to try and classify based on retrospective features if someone's got thyroid cancer or not. So we're going to use the skim function to bring this up, first of all. So hit run on this tab. There we go. So just in, let's inspect it slightly. So we've got a few screens that appear. So I like Skim because it gives you a, a good understanding and of the overall data. So we've got 3,772 rows with 28 columns. We've got two character columns and 26 numeric, perfect for uh, machine learning modeling. Group variables, we've got none thus far. We go into the a Skim of the variables. We can see if there's any missing values, how many complete, what's the min max value, et cetera and how many are empty. And there's more statistics that you can get from that, like um, if there's any white space, if you deal with text as well. And then, yeah, we've got all the skin variables. So we've got a couple of missing values in terms of patient age. So we're going to have to treat that later on. It's relatively complete though, with 99.9% .9 complete there. Everything else looks good. And then it shows you if there's any real anomalies in your data as well. So what's like the mean age of the patient? We've got, like, say, a mean there, standard deviation, et cetera. A 
and there's your histogram of what the, the quartiles look like in terms of ages. Right, so the, what we need to do first of all is we're going to have to clean up that missing data. So get your keyboards at the ready because this is where we're going to start typing as we go. So first of all, I'm going to create a data frame and I'm going to use, uh, call it TD clean. And we're going to use the TD variable that we've created already, this data frame here, sorry. And we're going to use a bit of base R. <clears throat> Apologies if you guys aren't base R users, but bear with me. So we're going to use the complete cases function. I'm going to pass in our data frame. And we're just going to look over rows. So we're looking at the complete cases over rows. And we're going to dim, TD clean, see what the dimensions look like. Okay, so we've got 2,751, 28 variables. Again, this is not a, a tutorial on feature engineering. That could last much longer than the two hours that we've got. We're going to focus today's tutorial on just building the models. But what you could do here is a lot of other things around replacing missing values. Instead of doing it, you could use like multiple implementation methods such as mice and, and, and similar like that that's, that's contained in the Python library. You can bring reticulate in. There is a mice um, function for R as well that you can bring in. There's other bit more basic um, types of imputation as well, like mean replacement, mean replacement, median replacement, modal replacement, et cetera but we're not going to get too bogged down in that today. Again, the aim is to build up the model frameworks for these. So I'm happy that I've got, this is not a massive data set for machine learning purposes, but I've got 2,751 observations that I can use to get going. So next thing we're going to do is we want to see how balanced our class labels are. So we want to see what the class distribution looks like over our data set. So we can click into these data frames and see what our class labels are. So these, because it's a classification task, we're only going to be able to predict whether someone's sick. That's what we're trying to aim from this, whether someone's got thyroid cancer, based on all these different variables in our model. So first of all, we want to see what that class distribution looks like. So get your keyboards at the ready again, because we're going to want to type we're going to want to type and call this table class as a variable and we're going to use the table function we use td clean the clean data set that we just created and we're going to look at the thyroid class so what's the distribution over that and then we're going to create another variable And we're going to call this original, class imbalance original, because we need to look at this twice. And because this will come back as a factor, I want to use the unclass function to get rid of the underlying class in R. And we're going to use a prop table. So we're going to look at the proportions of um, how many sick versus how many non-sick patients we've got in that data set. So I'm going to pass in into my prop table, the table class variable I've just created there. And then I'm going to slice those two columns from that. And again, this is some base R, so apologies. My, my R coding developed where I was a base R programmer and then the Tidiverse came along and you had to relearn some of these functions. So here we've got a massive imbalance of non-sick patients with thyroid cancer and a small proportion of sick patients so there are a few strategies that we can use to deal with this type of imbalance you could a get more data you could b do some different types of sampling stratified splitting etc what we're going to use is a technique sorry guys we've just got a few more people waiting in the waiting room i'm just going to admit them now apologies hi guys for you that have just joined we're we're just so we've just started coding along. Have you all cloned the um, have you cloned the repository if you're working locally or have you got the access to your studio cloud account where you're going to be working from today? 
just give me a thumbs up if that's okay and I can just skip through the previous <laughs> stuff we've just covered. I'll take that as a yes. So what we've just done thus far and what you'll need to do as well, apologies for you guys that have joined earlier, is we've got down to the, so you need to bring up the TA, uh, Tidy Models from Scratch student workbook, the uh, markdown book. And we're at the clean, we've done the clean imports phase. So what you need to do is copy this bit of code and I'll just give you a minute to do that. So you're going to create a variable called TD clean and you're going to get rid of the complete cases. And then you're going to look at the dimensions of that. And then if you need a bit more time on that screen, just while you're copying, apologies to everyone that's already started this. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, we installed XG Boost as well. So in install, XG Boost. And then you bring that in as a library, as Peter's quite rightly said. We're going to bring an XG Boost there into our installs. We're going to add the data should be already there in the data frame for you. Then we're going to clean these imports. Can you let me know if you're up to that position now? It's looking like we're there. So people are, are joining still, apologies to this. So guys, you'll need to open this TM from scratch student markdown notebook. You're gonna need to open this. Then what you need to do first of all is install XG Boost there. And then we're up to the clean imports phase. So you need to copy this code out. For those that have just joined, I will actually put this in the chat now. So that's the cleaning code step. This is to look at your class distribution step. So just put those into the relevant section so you can get going with us. And please give me thumbs up. I'll just give you a minute to do that. Give me thumbs up when you've done that. Okay, it looks like we're good. Apologies for that, everyone. So view class distribution then. So we're going to look at the class distribution. I was just explaining to everyone else that we've got a massive class imbalance in terms of predicting whether someone's got thyroid cancer. So these kind of classification problems happen a lot in the NHS. So predicting whether someone's going to arrive into an A&E um, &A &E department is a classification problem. Predicting whether someone's a stranded patient is a classification problem. Predicting length of stay bands is a classification problem. Predicting whether someone's going to have a diagnostic test is a classification problem. Predicting, predicting whether someone's going to DNA or cancel is a classification problem. And then if you're thinking about a regression model, it's when they're going to cancel, things like that. So, yeah, we've got a massive imbalance in terms of sick patients versus those that are negative. So then we just got on to techniques that you can use to deal with class imbalance. Apologies, it's just errors at the moment. Have you tried reinstalling them, Jacqueline?
Okay, no worries, no worries, Jacqueline. I'll share with you the code if we get we get to a point where we're a bit further on down the line. Apologies. Trying to keep up with too many screens at once. I'm not good at multitasking. <laughs> so yeah, we were just talking about ways that you can rebalance the data set. So there's, you know, there's lots of different ways you can do it. You can use rows, but we're going to use something called synthetic minority oversampling. So essentially it's a um, a bit like a clustering problem where you use an unsupervised approach to connect points that are close in a geometric space to other points. And then those inherit the features from those underlying data sets as well. So you think about that, not just in a singular dimension, but in multiple dimension space, those connections can become quite, quite complicated, especially the more columns that you get that you're trying to connect up. But yeah, we're going to use Smote essentially to then rebalance that sample. And we'll do that later on. First of all, we want to want to look at our continuous variables. So those that have, you know, take a continuous value. So anything with the number essentially. We're going to look at those continuous variables and we're going to chart them out just to have a look at the overall distribution. So just let me move things out of the way. So we're going to add some code underlying this exploratory data analysis section here. So keyboard to the ready, everyone. So we're going to use a, we're going to call this subset. I'm just going to take a subset of the data. And for you, Tidyverse fans, we're going to start using piping and all the new type of methods that you're probably used to. So we're going to select. You don't have to type deploy, by the way. I'll just do this out of convention because I like to reference namespaces. So we're going to use the thyroid and some of you might actually notice that I need to create this in the package. There is a, a misspelling with the thyroid issue in thyroid class. Patient age. We're going to use the TH, TSH HS reading. Can't speak today. The T3 reading. And again, if you look at the underlying data in the help function, this explains what all these mean. The ML data. And we're going to, what, what data set we're going to look at? We're going to look at the thyroid data set, aren't we? So there's explanations of what all these mean in the underlying help. And there's examples of different ways that you can create recipes in the help function as well. So some of what I'm presenting you today has been put into this package. So yeah, we're going to use a T3 reading. T4 reading. Pyrox. And if you don't know some of these, you can just do the old fashioned way to pick them yourself of thyroid, thyroid util rating. T4 reading, there we go. And I'll get rid of the selector now because it doesn't like that in deploy in tidyverse. And the FTI reading. And hopefully we've got all the spellings of these right. Okay, just let's run that just to make sure it works. Good. And we should have in our environment window, a subset frame. And this should contain all our, apart from the thyroid class, right? This should contain all our more continuous value, values that we're going to work with. Okay. And for some reason, it just, it's flicking around for me. So we've got this subset. And then we're going to bring in a source function. So that's essentially loading a function that I've already pre-populated because I didn't want to slow this, this coding session down. A function that I pre-populated, it'll be in your directory under project functions, this visualization. And it's essentially just a, a histogram plotter that does it over multiple um, frames. And you'll see what it does shortly. So I'm gonna now, so that's, you've created the subset data frame. We bought in the source function that we're gonna be working with and that'll appear in your environment there under histo plotter. That's coming from an external file. Now what we're going to do is create a plot object. I'm going to use the histo plotter function that we've just pulled in. We're going to use that subset data frame. We're going to say our class variable is this misspelled thyroid class. 
we're going to use the charts x axis label is it's going to be our thyroid classification label and please let me know if you're keeping up with this everyone thumbs up thumbs down go a bit slower go a bit faster <laughs> Excellent, I've got one thumb up so far. That's good. Excellent, right. So now I'm gonna add the y-axis. And the box pot color, whatever color you want there, you can mess around with that. If you know the hexadecimal code of one that you like, which is what I'm going to use at the moment. Copy that over from the hex code binder that I've got. Oops. Okay. And the box fill. box fill transparency as well. Okay, and then let's just run that up to this point to see that we've got everything that we need. You guys also should have this bit already completed in your student workbook. All we're gonna do separately to that is we create the plot. We're just gonna add a theme, a different theme to the plot just so it looks a little bit nicer. We're gonna get rid of the legend and we're gonna add some manual color scaling. So negative equals red and positive equals blue. Okay, so when you've run that, I'll let you get there to that point. One second, guys. Okay, so the next bit that we're going to do is we're going to look at the distribution. So we should all have that. If you can just put your thumb up just to say you've got to that point. Excellent. It's looking good. It's looking good. Have in the chat if you're not at that point. And I can, I can then drop some of the code in for you. I'll assume we're there then. Great. So let's just expand this out a little bit. Put the code in just on a second. Yeah, sure. Jacqueline, where did you get up to? Can you just type it, type it for me if that's okay? Are we still struggling with all of it? <laughs> okay, excellent. Right, I'll add I'll add the code up to up to where we've got to now, right? So this is the under the clean import section. This is the view class distribution section. This is the EDA section. So we're only there anyway, that's fine. Let's just speed it up. There's the EDA section as well. So just get to that point, Jacqueline, and then just give me a thumbs up. I'll just keep explaining why you get there. So you can see that we've got generally distributing around the mean. There's a, quite a lot of outliers though. So you could use methods for clipping these outliers, removing them, scaling the variables, etc. There's loads of different ways that you can utilize scaling in the recipe steps. And I'll show you a few, but I did a previous webinar on this around how you can scale some data. Um, so you can normalize those that distribution. But generally, yeah, we've got a difference in some of the patient ages as well. You know some some really questionable variables down here around could could be young people with thyroid thyroid issues um not too sure but they've got negative for thyroid cancer seems to be in the upper upper age limits where you get it in terms of the patient age t3 readings so that's a reading that's taken in terms of how well your thyroid is functioning and there's different scales here but it seems to levitate around this this level about 2.3 or something like that. 
the T4 readings, again, there's some outliers there that we've got that generally around the 100 mark, and those that are sick are a little bit lower than that. And then you've got your thyrox utilization rates as well, and the TSH reading. And I was saying to, for those that you have joined, this help around the package. So if you need help on the actual how to how to use the data set, then that's fine. If you want to look up the data set in itself, you could just do that. Hopefully it works. No, it's not works. Do this. Just do question mark and that should prompt some help. Yep, there we go. So you can see that we've got these different variables, thyroid class, the binary classification label, indicating whether they're sick, patient age, patient gender, they've been prescribed thyroxin, if they've been queried while they're on thyroxin, if they've been prescribed antithyroid meds, if they're sick, pregnant, if they've had thyroid surgery, um, radioactive iodine therapy for killing off the thyroid, if they've got hyperthyroidism, hypo or hyperthyroidism, if they've got a goat ear, so a growth on their neck, they've got tumour, hypopopitalism, I can't even say that word, <laughs> if they've uh, been diagnosed with an underactive thyroid, if they've got any psychological conditions, the TSH measurement as a flag, the reading, whether it's been measured, the reading, whether it's been measured, the reading, and all those utilisation rates there. So you can look at what the data set actually means. So cool. We've got to visualising the data then. All good. Great stuff. And Jacqueline, have you caught up? Can you just give me a, like a yes in the, in, the, in the chat or a thumbs up? Not quite. Okay. I'll keep going. I'll keep going because I've sent you the code. But when we get there, you should, you should be in the same place. Apologies. So the next thing to do with machine learning, what you tend to do is divide it into a, you can do it three ways, right? You can do something called cross-validation and division of the data. What we're going to do initially is something called a simple train and test split. So you hold out some for training and some for model, ev model evaluation later on. And this is kind of standard practice when you're putting forward any types of ML, ML model, tabular, a vision model, so looking at images, a textual model, which is what my company does a lot of, um, textual classification, and there's other, other ways that you can do that. So the next step we're going to do is we're going to we're going to essentially divide our data into a train and test split. Okay, so we're going to use this clean data set. We're going to create a variable, TD. We're going to use the TD clean data set again. Oops, apologies. We're going to pipe. We're going to mutate. So we're going to use the mutate function. And again, you don't have to use the full namespacing. It's just what I prefer, I would class. So we're gonna, we're gonna cast this to a factor because in ML, for ML models to work in R, there needs to be a factor. So a two factor representation of whether someone's sick or not sick. So that'd be neg the negative label. And we're gonna use this thyroid class, right? So what we're doing is creating a factor variable that thyroid class initially. And what we're going to do is, because we've got a categorical variable, there are ways to treat this in machine learning. The best way to do it would be to create a recipe step and do dummy encoding, um, essentially. So it looks at the categories and provides a one or zero based on if they fit into that category. Then we drop one of the classification levels. There's a lot of good stuff around uh, tidy models of dummy encoding. And I've done some previous tutorials around how you can encode those as well. Again, they're all going to be captured in my GitHub, so I'll, I'll provide you access to that later on. We're going to drop the referral source at the moment because it doesn't really give me too much more information. And we're just going to just going to really hammer home that we want to drop NAs in that data set. So if we run this again, it'll overwrite the previous TD clean. We should have this now as a so if you look at the structure of that you should see that you've now got a factor variable created oh let's have a look at the thyroid class we want to look at the structure of that just to make sure it's a factor something like that 
Oh, it's the referral source. Probably misspelled it. That's weird. Apologies, guys. Just let me sort this out. It's just column doesn't exist. Oh, I right. yeah, I know why. Because I've run it once, right? So we've already we've already dropped that column. Apologies. Can't run that that cell again because it's already been enacted. So the next step, we're going to add another cell here because that. Let's go get rid of that in a sec. I might just have to comment that out for now. Because it's, if I keep running it, it's just going to break that cell now. Sorry, guys. Let me just comment that out. Right, okay. Now, what we're going to do is split this data set. So we're going to create a TD split, so thyroid disease split. And we're going to use the we're going to use the um, all resample package from the tidy models. It's the first package that we're going to work with. So we're going to use initial splits, so all sample. We're going to pass in our TD clean data set. We're going to say we want to stratify it. So we're going to do a stratify split by our thyroid. And the good thing about this function is it deals with the stratification for you. We're going to divide it into a proportion of the holdout 80% from our training set. And we're going to specify the stratification breaks as well. So if I run that, I should have my TD split variable. It will create a list item that we're going to use later in our tidy models workflow. Next, we're going to create the training data set. I'm going to pass in TD, the TD split function. So it will say for training, hold out 80%. And for test, testing, which is the special variable that you need to call it, from the R sample package, we're going to use that. So let's run this, everyone. We should have a train and test set. And you'll see that it's held out 80% of observations for training and um, the other 20% for testing. Jacqueline, if you caught up now, do we need to copy the code in for anyone into the chat? I'll assume we've caught up. <laughs> right, okay. Cool. So this is just the code for this part. You need to uncomment. If you're running it for the first time, you'd need to uncomment that top line. Because what it will do is drop that referral source column. So now we should have this, we should have our training and test samples. We should have our original TD clean sample as well good the next step is to create the initial recipe so we'll follow along with the i'll follow along with the actual prettier looking markdown so we've used our sample which is one of the methods we're going to now use recipes i'm going to do a few things to this so let's go to the recipe step and let's call this our train recipe. We can use recipes, which is a package in a in tidy models to do something to the training set that we've got. So we're going to use recipes recipe. And I'm going to use the thyroid class as the thing I'm trying to predict. Then you use a, a tilde. Say I want to predict it on everything else. So all my other um, predictor variables in that. So essentially in my trading data set, this is the outcome we're trying to predict. And we're going to use everything else alongside it to make that prediction as independent variables if you're a traditional statistician or uh, predictors if you're doing it from more of a model base. We use the data is equal to training. Okay. And then I'm going to pipe through again. And what we're going to do now is we talked about using um, synthetic minority oversampling a little bit further up here. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and rebalance that data set. 
um, based on, we're going to use more of the minority classes, so the sick patient data, and we're going to oversample that. So we're going to have more samples of sick people, and we're going to downsample the, the non-sick representation from that. And again, there are there are probably a few warning signs around doing it with such a class imbalance, but this is just to show you how you can actually do it. So we're going to use the Themis package, and this has got loads of different ways that you can um, resample and downsample. So you can see you've got rows in there that I discussed earlier, smotes, um, and there's then extensions on that as well, using different metrics. We use the traditional smote algorithm for this one. <clears throat> Apologies. So we're going to use the thyroid. What did I call it again? My misspelling. Apologies for everyone for this thyroid class. I'm going to over. We're going to oversample it massively by ninety-seven percent, and we're going to use three neighbouring points. Do you, do you remember what we saw earlier? Because it's a geometric algorithm, a bit like nearest neighbours if you want to look that machine learning algorithm up in the future. We can use three local points around our central node to map those features in a three-dimensional space. So that's a very much a 2D representation of it. In a 3D representation, you're going to be, it'll probably blow your mind. <laughs> so we're going to use three neighbours. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to remove something called zero variance of our predictors. So anything that's not actually useful as a predictor, let's get rid of it. So we're going to use this on all our predictors. So just to recap, create a recipe. We want to predict the thyroid class with all the other um, predictor variables. We're going to use our training data. We're going to uh, um, oversample, and then we're going to get rid of any zero variance predictors. So if I run that, that will work up to this point. We're going to add some more code here. Once we've got a recipe, we need to, there's different ways to do this. We're going to prep and juice it. I didn't come up with the variable naming. Uh, blame Max Kuhn and Julia Silge for this one. Could you hold on? I mean, I, I've just had to install Themis and it's just slowed me down a bit. Um, yeah, sure. We don't know if anybody else is. Sorry. Right, okay. Is anyone else had that issue? If not, bring it in. Yes, because it wasn't requested as the one to installed. Apologies. Let's just let's just hold fire then while that, that one installs. Can you get just let me know when it's finished so we can Yeah. Sorry. Um, would you mind explaining again whilst we while we're oversampling? Because we've got a massive imbalance in our in our negative labels. So if we try and train this model now with with a, to try and predict sick patients, all it's going to see is the negative samples. So oh. assume that you're training on, like you say, that's two thousand odd samples. Ninety two percent of those are going to be negative samples. Yeah. So it'll see a lot more of those features. Whereas if we want to make it more rebalanced, so we want to pick out what sick patients look like, so what are the features of a sick patient, yeah. we need to resample that just so we get more instances of the sick patient. So when they're presented, the model will know, actually, these weights look like a sick patient over a non-sick patient. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, I'd, there is research around the level of imbalance and what you should do with different algorithms. Smoke's generally a good choice if you've got like 80 20 imbalance or 70 30, but there are some better algorithms out there. Personally, to me, what I'd do is get more data and try and try and come up with more creative ways to sample. But this is an example of how you can actually use it to, to actually work with some data in that might be imbalanced. Okay. Seems like magic. Sorry? Seems like magic. <laughs> it is magic. The underlying the underlying mathematics behind it are a, a nearest neighbor algorithm, if you're interested in that. And you can read about that in Introduction to Statistical Learning, which is a really good free PDF that I can link after this. I think I did one of my demonstrations around 
how you can look at some of the underlying algorithms and get a better understanding of what they're doing. So we're all at the themis point now, guys. I'll say that was a yes. Yeah, cool. Right. Good stuff. So that, what we're going to do now is we're going to want to prep and juice our recipe. So, oops, I'm going mad. Of course, you can't do that. You know, I want to pipe through from your trainer recipe, recipe and want to prep it. And then we're going to juice it. So then what you should get is this training data frame, which is essentially the data frame after we've applied this recipe and produced all those steps. Okay. So we've got this training data frame now. You can see that the, the data size has changed because we've done that over, over sampling technique. So it's looked at those sick patients and it's gone these features look like a sick patient in that three-dimensional space using that nearest neighbor's algorithm. And yeah, we've got more now, more examples that we can use to build our model weights in our underlying model for predicting future sick patients. So now if we look at the class imbalance after smoke, which you should have that already pre-completed in your workbook, You've got class imbalance after smoke, and I'm going to get rid of the, the class that it belongs to in R. So use the on class function to remove any other underlying classes that might be like S3 classes that are built. We're going to use the proportion table again to look at that split. We're going to then look at the table function. And another, another way you could do that in Python is just pipe through from the back. You could say, I want the table, then I want to do a prop table, then I want to unclass it. Similar to this table. Prop table. That's how you do it in, in the plier. Prop table, then on class, something like that. Just a, a way of wrapping it around in traditional base R. Again, I've, I'm I'm a bit of a base R user myself. Um, I kind of I've got a weird mangled version of what my R code looks like nowadays. So yeah, we've got negative samples. We've got fifty percent negative, and we're we're getting good now. We've got really balanced data set in that set in that sense so we've okay. really oversampled on those sick patients and I've that got an error. it's not that running for me sorry i've got an error i've got can't rename variables in this context or some weird which part can you just paste in your code uh, into the chat? and i can i can add this for you if need be just to run it i've done that Got Train recipe, recipe. That somewhat unhelpful error. Ah, I get it. You've not you oh, step you step ZV or predictors. Yeah. You need this. You need to Oh right, sorry. It's a method with no in, no inputs, so you need to put that. See if that works, and then give it a try. Mm, okay, I think I'm getting the same error. Uh, let's try again. Can you try running, just copying the code that I've pasted and see if that, that resolves it? Yep. Uh, could be, there could be a few more issues in that. Not there, more. Yeah. So look at the train recipe.
apologies guys let's give it a minute just while we catch up i want everyone to be in the same place no um you've got a you in your neighbors on your original one robin oh good spot still not working though i'm still getting all columns selected for the step should be numeric Okay, so I think you missed a step then, potentially, because we did a, what does your split look like when you're passing in your training frame? Here. It could be either. So your train frame should be. Yeah. Fire really cloud. And it uh, should be all the new the continuous variables there. Can you go that uh so what do I got? I've got thyro plus. Did you drop this, Robin? This bit. Oh, uh maybe I've un uh, yeah, I ran that again and I didn't drop it, maybe. Let's try that. Uh, try that because that will that would present that error because that's a continuous variable. Right, hang on. Let's run that. Not a continuous variable, sorry, categorical. And then run that. Yes, works now. Well done. Thank Apologies. you. Apologies. Yeah, Sorry. we'll get there in the end. <laughs> Perfect. Right. Good stuff. Right. So now we've divided our sample and we've created our recipe. We know that we've we've kind of sorted some of the imbalance issues. Again, you know, we might we might be tending to overfit this because we'd want to see more of what a sick patient looks like. But the, for the sake of this example, that's how you'd apply synthetic minority oversampling. And again, there's a good there's a good book that I will link on nearest neighbor algorithms and it goes into the underlying mathematics around how it, how it works, but not too heavy. So then we're going to create this in the next step. We should, you should already have this completed in your session. We're going to run this imbalance frame. So we're going to compare what our original one looks like over after we applied smoke. So everyone should, should have already had that in their workbook. So just run that for me. And hopefully that works. Let's get some thumbs up, please. Fingers crossed. Good. Right. So now we're going to move on to model training. So we're going to create a baseline model, first of all, one that you're probably all familiar with, the logistic regression model, which is an extension on a, uh, an order of least squares regression model, just with a logic loss connection function that essentially turns it into a classification function using the sigmoid curve. Again, I can put some of that underlying mathematics in that, but logistic regression is quite a popular algorithm that's been researched. I have linked a lot of things around this workbook. So when you run the, when you knit the HTML after this session, all those links will work. And I'll post a public link to the RPUB site where this is all hosted as well. So we're going to initialize the model. So let's get on to this step here. So it should be line 206 for everyone. So we're going to initialize the model. So we're going to use now another package called Parsnip, which is, I don't know, some weird name and convention. So we had Carrot, which was Max Kuhn's previous modeling package. And I've done a tutorial on Carrot methods. I've, I've linked that in the GitHub later on about a couple of years ago. So there's Carrot. And then they, they then turn it into parsnip. So what you'll find is there's more of the popular algorithms are supported with parsnip, but they're still developing it. So it's not in a stage where you can get everything you need like you can from carrot. So it's good to know both. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a logistic regression model. And I'm going to use parsnip. I'm going to use the logistic reg. Okay. You can put things in like regularization, so you'll see a mixture of methods that you can pass. So it'll assume that there's no regularization method initially. And then we're going to set our engine. So this is essentially a bit of a hack. So the set engine thing is saying use the GLM package. So sometimes when you run this, we might need to bring in the GLM package later on. It should come shipped with tidy models, but not always. So we're going to print out our linear regression model. So let's run this. 
So you can see that we've got the computational engine, GLM, which is the separate package that it runs. So these are just wrappers that then run additional packages on top. So has everyone got that message you were there? Cool. So once we've done the recipe and we've, we've specified what model we wanna use in that function, we're gonna create a model workflow. So that's the next step. So you initialize the model with Parsnip, and then we can create this model workflow using the workflows package. So next step, get ready to type. We're gonna use the linear regression workflow. And we're gonna specify workflow. We're going to then add a model to our workflow. And that'll be that linear regression model we just created. And then we're going to add our recipe. So our pre-processing steps. And that's our train recipe. So run those lines. Ah. Nope, me being silly again with my selectors, apologies. We're adding a variable called linear regression workflow. Then we're going to pipe through from workflow into add model and then add recipe. Okay. So that creates a list. So there's your pre-processing steps in the list. There's your fit object, which is the model itself. And then that's what happens after it. And that's what the train model is set to once you've trained it. Initially, when you've initialized it, it's always going to be false because we've not trained the model yet. So let's run that again. So we've got this linear regression model now. So create the model from the workflow, add the model, initialize the previous step, then add the recipe. Okay, is everyone there? Okay, good stuff. So we're then gonna fit the model, right? So we're going to call this object linear regression, a uh, logistic regression, sorry, fit. We'll use the logistic regression workflow we've just created. And we use the fit object of tidy models to say data is equal to train. So essentially, create a variable, use the workflow we've just created with the relevant steps. So we create a workflow, add a model, add a recipe. Then we're going to say use that workflow and then just fit it to our training data. Okay, so run that line. It's fine. So we've got that model now. It's fit. We've got a fit object that's been created, and you'll see now trained turns to true, and you'll get a model in there as well in the fit object when you're looking at the list and under exposing the underlying fit object. So it's like a list down so it's a list within a list so you've got the main model object then you've got the fit object then a list object inside that which is fit then another one called fit inside that and then you've got all the coefficients and residuals and how it was fitted and your effects and your p-values and things like that your t-score so we're going to pull the model fit now so we're going to extract this fitted data We've got, we're going to call it LR fitted, create this variable. We use the LR fit object that we've just created. We're going to use the parsnip object extract fit parsnip. And then we're going to use the tidy function. I think that's from Broom to tidy up the outputs because it's it works with linear models really well. So we've got LR fitted now. So you've got all the fit objects, you've got the term, so the actual predictor variable, what its coefficient is, what its standard error, standard error is, what the statistic is and what the p-value is. Okay, so we've created that fit object. In the next step, this should all be filled in for you. I thought instead of subjecting it to this part, I would, I would not make you code it, but I'll explain to you what it does. So we're going to 
create this another object called LR fitted add or a better name convention that we could perhaps come up with. We're going to use the LR fitted that we just created up there, this object. We're going to mu mutate and create a significance column. So we can say if it's significant um, with a p value of less than five, then we're going to create significant or insignificant. We're going to arrange it by the p values. We're going to then add uh, a plot. So we're going to use the coefficient term and the p value. The fill is going to be the significance of this p value. We're going to add a geometric column. We're going to add a theme with an element text. So we're going to create a bold font face of this color, of this size, of this angle. And then we're going to add labels to it. So p value, terms, title, subtitle, and a caption. And then we're going to animate it with ggplotly. So that would then run. You should all be at this stage now. And then you can see your, your variables really that is significant to that logistic regression model. And you've only got a few really, like the age is significant. Um, if they've been on a hypothyroidism, that seems to be significant. If they've got a psychological condition, it seems to be relatively significant. There's some other variables that actually are adding nothing to it or whether someone's pregnant has no real effect based on this data set. So that then allows you to animate those that object so that extracted fit tidy it up with broom we're then going to create this 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 chart this graphic okay and might so, all be different because of sampling sorry may our like my graph doesn't look like yours and is that just because we've sampled yeah because it's random it's it's random right so your yeah. training and test split would be different i would think right. yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah, I, that's a good point though, actually for the it's tutorial. Set the seed, right? And then we set the seed, seed value, yeah. That would be a good idea for, for rep reproducibility. But yeah, I mean, it's all good. I think if you start building too much of that stuff into tutorials and people use it live, um, it can become quite dangerous. I've seen that, especially in Python tutorials with SK Learn, where they set a random state value. They forget to unset that and then they, they wonder why they're always getting the same results. And yeah, you've got to be careful with some of that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we get a we get a similar looking p-value significance chart to that. I know there's a lot of debate around usage of p-values for significance, but yeah, that's one way that we can do it in um, with the outputs of our model. I've also did a I did a blog for all views, and I'll, I'll link that in around how you can use another one of my packages called Odds Plotty to create odds ratios. So you can look at it in terms of significance in relation to odds ratios. I'll link that, that tutorial in as well. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to train a tree-based boosting model. So in, in when you're looking at tabular ML, there's a lot of traditional ML algorithms that you used. A lot of people tend to just go straight or used to go straight towards random forests as a way to improve model accuracy and essentially uses um, ensembling methods. So with machine learning, there's three main types of ensembling methods. Boosting, so you use gradient boosting to minimize the error. That's what we're gonna use with XG boosts. You can use bagging, so sets of trees and then they do ensemble voting. And you can use stacking, so stacking is like stacking algorithm results together then coming up with a fitness score at the back of that. Again, I, I explore some of this more so in the carrots tutorial that I did, and I don't want to get too involved in some of that. But what we're going to look at today is a boosting model, and we're going to use XG Boost. And for whoever's interested, there's a really good tutorial on XG Boost around what it actually do, does. So it's elements of supervised uh, learning. You're going to use an objective function. You can use regularization and training loss. It's going to minimize that, that you're going to look for in your, your XGBoost model. And we're going to use it with a log logistic loss function because we're going to create a classification model. And what it does is it uses an additive principle. So it will grow single decision trees. And then it will look at where the optimal leaf splits are in those decision trees. And then it grows many trees together. And it uses something called gradient descent to optimize the uh, the loss function. 
And again, some of the, I don't want to get into this, some of the stats get pretty heavy as you go a little bit further down. But overall, if you just read what each bits are doing, it's actually really, really useful. And what XGBoost does really well is something called additive training. So it will look at a set of objective trees and it will remove the trees that aren't actually best describing the thing you're trying to predict until you more or less know, and it will just keep doing this in an iterative fashion until you know which classification it is or they know where the optimal splits are in terms of information gain and something called Gini cross entropy, which is another thing in itself, if you're really interested in learning that. But yeah, the I'll... I'll link this introduce, introduction to XGBoost in with the, the tutorials as well. And I think I've actually done that in the, the actual um, markdown output that supports this. So yeah, the next step that we're going to do, so we're going to take it from a real baseline model to a real cutting edge, what I call a Kaggle winner type model. So first thing to do is set the model up. So we're going to go down to this bit and we're going to set up our model. So add the code, it should be on line 302 for everyone. We need to call it XGBoost model. And we're going to use the boost tree from Parsnip. And here what we're going to do is something called hyperparameter tuning. So there's going to be a few parameters that we're going to want to tune. We're going to want to look at the number of trees and we're going to want to look at the depth of the tree. So the number of trees we want to grow, we're going to use the dials package and we're going to use the tune function. So create an empty tuning grid for now until we know which variables we want to tune. And I'll explain this in a bit further depth later on. We're going to use the tree depth. Okay. And the empty placeholders, essentially empty grids of variables that we're going to want to tune. So the number of trees will be like from 100 trees to 200 trees, and it's going to try a permutation of all those values. We're going to set the mode of our object to so classification. You can use HGBoost with the regression as well as it saw, as you saw in the introduction to boosted trees at the top. The objective loss, you either can have mean squared error or a logistic loss or a custom loss function of your choosing, um, but that needs a bit more work. But yeah, I you know for regression models, you'd use your, your mean squared error, right? So your prediction, your y hats over your actual y variable, subtract it, so the prediction, subtract the actual value, square it, take the sum of all those squares, you get your mean squared error. Okay, I'm going to set the mode equal to classification. I'm going to set the engine. Hang on, I've not closed out that. Set engine to XGBoost. And this is where it's going to use the XGBoost package. As I said, that in Parsnet, these are just wrappers to external packages, essentially. So once everyone's at this step, we can get going. So I'll just run that. So you've got your XGBoost model, same similar arguments that you saw with the logistic regression model. You've got your number of trees. Again, at the moment, we'll have nothing in there because we, we want to tune it with a grid. These are all the hyperparameters it can actually take. So it's really good to inspect the actual model lists. So you get to XGBoost, look at the list and see what orgs it, it needs you to pass. So this tree depth, how far down you want to go into a tree and the number of splits and leaves, what the learning rate is. So in terms of gradient descent, how how much you want the model to learn by at each pass through that, um, that step, through that um, gradient descent step, what the loss reduction needs to look like, what the sample size. And you essentially can, can, tra can train combinations of all these hyperparameters together to come up with the optimal model fit. So you essentially say, I don't know what the optimal model solution looks like. I'd have to try, you know, permutations to the power of 100 to get to get to where I need to go. Let the model do the choosing for you. And that's essentially what the, the, the purpose of hyperparameter tuning is. And in this, this context, we're using grid-based grid tuning, not random tuning. 
And again, I'll, I'll give you some resources around hyperparameter tuning as well, but it is covered in my previous tutorial in Carrot. Okay. So XG boost, we're going to use the boost tree. We're going to use these 2D grids. We're going to make sure it's a classification model because we're going to try to predict whether someone's got thyroid cancer or not. We're going to set the engine equal to XG boost. Okay. The next thing we need to do, because we've created an empty tuning grid, so an empty set of values, we're going to want to pass the, the candidate values to those grids. So this is where we use a package called dials. So I'm going to say boost grid dials grid regular. We're going to set trees and tree depth in our grid. I'm going to try the number of different combinations. So you set levels. And the more levels you put, the longer it's going to take, essentially, because it's going to look at how far down it needs to go in all the different permutations. So to control this initially, we want to set a relatively low number of levels. But to get a more highly performant model, you could say, give me a thousand levels, give me 10,000 levels, give me this many thousand levels, and it'll train all day. It'll train for three days. Um, levels equals three. And then we're going to create our resampling method. So here, what we're going to do in our training step, we're going to divide it up to five separate batches of training samples. You can do five or 10 in terms of cross-validation sampling. So K fold, the number of Ks that you want to choose, the number of different folds that you want to separate into that cross-validation sample. And this is where it's normally best practice to utilize instead of just having a simple training and test split because it gives you multiple examples of what it would look like across different data sets. So how the performance of the model is across different samples or different batches. And that's normally a better, better, um, more scientific method of identifying what your mean accuracy looks like or what your mean area under the curve looks like when you're looking at classification. So yeah, we're going to set this boost grid. We've set our number of levels to three. And I'm going to just create that for now. And you're going to see that the dials package, instead of hard coding values, is going to put the values in that it knows that you want to you want to utilize for that specific model. So I want one tree, I want a thousand trees, I want two thousand trees. I want to go one deep in terms of the tree. I want to go eight deep in terms of the tree and how many splits we get. So how many variables we use to branch off. I'm going to want 1,000, 2,000. And again, that's quite a simple grid. Let's have a look at if I went 30 levels. And this would take much, much, much longer. You've got many more splits. So it's trying many more permutations, like one tree, 69 trees. 138 trees, 204 trees, 276, 345. And then it would do it by the different tree depths. And then if you can imagine all the options that you, you had there previously for hyperparameter tuning, all those separate options that we had when we constructed this grid, it was massive. You, could, you can keep going. It was the XG boost model, right? So if you go down here, you can see all the orgs and then you can see it could have a combination of tree depth, trees, tree depth, learning rate, minimum number, loss reduction. And the more of these you add, the more things you try and tune for, the longer and longer your, your iterative algorithm is going to take to, to train that. So it's going to search through all those possible combinations. And that's why it's called hyperparameter tuning, because it looks through all those permutations. So we're just going to go for three levels for now. And then we're going to create a number of folds. So again, this can also increase model training time because it's going to take the training set and divide it into five separate training folds. So it's going to say, what's the accuracy of this subsample? What's the accuracy of this subsample? What's the accuracy of this subsample? And so on. So we're going to use the vfold cross-validation function. We use training and we're going to set the k because it's k fold, so the number of k's equal to five, we're going to set five fold here. Okay, so let's run this. Is everyone up to this stage?
دیگری looking good okay so now I'm going to create the XG boost model workflow so we created a workflow before this shouldn't be new to us we're going to create the XG boost model workflow so I'm going to call it XG boost workflow I'm going to use the workflow package again from workflows to create workflow I'm going to add a model. I'm going to add a recipe. And that's our original recipe that we did up here. So you have to create a recipe once, unless you want to do different things to it. So when we created our training recipe, it was all the way back up here somewhere. Would have been there, right? Yeah, there's our training recipe all the way back up at line 156. So we're going to use that recipe again, just keep recycling that recipe because we've used it once, right? For repeatability. Let's just get rid of these. So if we run that, you should have your XGBoost workflow, your model, and your recipe. And then what we're going to do now is we're going to try the iterating through the best combinations of our folds, so our separate subsamples, and those hyperparameter grids that I told you about. So all those various combinations of the tree level, the tree depth, the tree, and it would just keep going through those in an iterative pattern as for each of those five subsamples. So it can take a while if you keep, like say, if you ramp that up, fold. That's where you need to start using parallel processes and things like that. Boost workflow. So we're going to use our tune grid. I'm going to take our resamples. Like I said, that those resamples that we're going to use, the number of folds that we've created. And we use our grid is equal to our boosting grid. And then we're going to use under this, before we run it, I'm going to say head collect metrics XG boost and whatever we called this XG boost fold. Okay. So if we run this now, you'll see your computer start to work to life, hopefully. And then I think this is an ideal time once you've set this bit off to go and grab yourself a cup of tea. Are we all up to this point, guys? Have we got the model training? How long do you think it should take? Is this like... It'll be... It probably will take around about five minutes. So we could start to do some of the other steps, but just not run them. Might be a good way to do it. Would that be a good approach? Yeah, let's go. So... After this, we won't run this step yet, but to select the best model, and this will become more apparent, we'll use best model. And we're going to use the XG boost fold. And hopefully we don't take down the whole of our studio cloud while we're all training XG boost models at the same time. Select best. Area under the curve, rock area under the curve. I'd recommend that anyway, because we've still got a slight imbalance and accuracy can be misleading when there's an imbalance in the classification label. So let that run and then we'll run this line next. Hopefully it shouldn't be too much longer.
Mine seems to have finished, guys. Just let me know when yours is done um, by typing in the chat. Excellent. Looks like we're getting to a good place then. So it's tried all those combinations. So those trees with different tree depths, and it's also looked over the two metrics that the two metrics that we we can optimize for in tidy models, which is accuracy and area under the curve. Our estimator is obviously a binary classification task because we're only trying to predict two outcomes, so sick over non-sick, and then it's giving you the mean estimate right for accuracy and um rock as well accuracy we've looked at the ten, number of 10 and then you get a standard error so how, how often it it gets it wrong what we're going to do now is so you don't have to go through that whole, whole grid yourself that's not too big we can kind of more or less figure out if we're using accuracy then this combination here that high parameter so thousand trees at tree depth one with this parameter here is going to be our best most performant model. So because of that, we're going to pick that specific model to use later on when we're estimating. Okay. So the next thing to do, we should have been typing this while we were waiting for the model to train. If we've not, I can wait a second, but we're going to select the best model using the rock area under the curve. Okay, so now we've got our best model. It's that one that we said. Oh, with tree death 15, actually, it's, there must have been a few more in that data set. We selected the best model. Okay, and this bit should now be popular, um, populated for you. So we've got our most performed model using uh, rock area under the curve. I think I can add you some reading around why we'd use area under the curve and why it's good for imbalanced data sets after this session. We're going to visual, visualize our results. So this already should be there for you. It's just a way to look at it with ear under the curve, a number of trees, and at what depth it starts to increase in terms of ear under the curve inaccuracy. You've got some really performant ones on this line already anyway. But that's just a way that we can visualize that. And you should have been able just to run that from the pre-existing code that was in there. So the next thing to do, We've got our most performant model. We've done our hyperparameter tuning. We've looked across five different subsamples, resamples. And again, to get even more performant model, we should train that for much longer with many more combinations of those hyperparameters to choose the best one, the best ones. But I've kept it sparse in terms of two hyperparameters to um, two hyperparameters to tune for now. So now what we're going to do now is we're going to finalize our workflow and we're going to fit the best model. So we're going to actually train it once more with that best, most performant model. We need the XGBoost workflow. We need to finalize workflow. And we use our best model. So you've got your final model ready to go that's been extracted and you can print your final workflow sorry final workflow just to get the output of that so you can see that this workflow it's got recipes the models boosting trees so boosting tree which is what we've looked at here introduction to boosted trees we've used step smote so we've used oversampling and we've got rid of zero varying predictors so those that have got zero variance in the arguments in terms of our main arguments because we've chosen the best hyperparameters from that hyperparameter tuning phase here we've got trees a thousand with tree depths 15 so we're going to use that to then evaluate our data on our test set later on so the last thing to do because we've collected that model we've not actually fit it yet is to create the final XG boost bit object. We use the final workflow. We use the last bit TD split. And if you run that again, you should just get a final workflow. It might take a 
a minute. No, it didn't even take that long. We all at that stage. We've got this final workflow. Okay. Cool. So we can start doing stuff with the data now, which is cool. Yeah, I should have put that up there, sorry. Doesn't matter. Right, what we're gonna do now is under this stage, let me just move this guys, I've put it in the wrong cell, dough. We should have put it here, it's okay. So put it under there, let's run that again. Cool, we've got that final XGBs fit. So the next thing we're gonna do is collect our metrics for evaluation. So we get this final, XG boost bit collects metrics. So now you can see that actually <clears throat> we've got a really highly performant model just through that oversampling. Um, you know, without error under the curve, we get 99.2 overall accuracy. So the next thing to do is say, okay, we know this accuracy estimate, but what's that actually made up of? We want to evaluate that on our test set. So we're gonna look at the workflow fit first as well. So we're gonna say, let's extract the workflow XG boost fit. Final XG boost fit. We're going to extract workflow and we want to get the model fit object as well. We'll actually get what the model, underlying model is for later if we want to serialize the model and put it into production. Okay, so we'll run those two. And we've got this XG boost model fit. You can see it's a large XG booster model. We've got, well, it's not really that large, it's only one megabyte. Um, I've had ones going into hundreds of gigs. And then we've got our final list of our XG boost model as well. So we've got this workflow fit here, workflow XG boost fit. And you see that it's been trained now. We've got all our fit objects there in that list, complicated list that we saw earlier. And you've got all your evaluations and feature names and things like that. So all the character characters that have been passed through there. So patient age, patient gender, those continuous variables that we prepped earlier. Okay. Okay. For some reason my mouse just keeps jumping around. Apologies for this. I can't seem to get it back to the other side. <laughs> All Studio Cloud, eh? Lovely. I'll get rid of a few of these frames. It's my fault. It's too cluttered now. Oh, you just got to just bear with me. Right, back. Back on to the work the notebook now. So we've got our workflow fit and we've got a final fitted model. We know that it's quite highly performant. So what we're going to do now is do some model evaluation. Okay. So we're going to do this once just to go, go through the process. And then I've added the next one for you in terms of the logistic regression steps. So I'm going to create a couple of functions here. We're going to pass our test data through the model. We call it testing fit. And we, these are going to be our actual class labels. We use the predict function to predict with our workflow XG boost fit test. I'm just going to run that to make sure I've spelled that right. Ah, yeah, I didn't think I had. Work flow. Right, so we've got a testing fit class labels. So if you look at those, 
They all have predictions. So what the model predicts for that particular patient, that person's sick, that person's negative. And the good thing about doing it against a testing set is we know what our prediction labels are versus our ground truth labels. So we know actually what the class labels are before we push this out into production. And then we're going to do the testing fits, probs, probabilities. I'm going to predict, and I'll probably spell this wrong again. XG boost fit. Use a test. I'm going to specify a type this time to prob and get the raw probabilities underneath it. So if we run this again, just do it in an iterative fashion. We've got these testing fit probs now. So you get the actual probability of the patient being negative, so not having thyroid cancer over being sick with thyroid cancer, based on all those different variables. So now we've got our predictions. Cool stuff. What I'm going to do now is combine these together. So I'm going to bind these to our actual test data. We're going to use a create a data frame called predictions. So we're going to go predictions. I'm going to use the C bind function. So bind two columns together, two disparate data sets. Test the testing data frame which we've made our predictions on. Testing bit probs, give me the probabilities. And then the testing bit classification labels. And then I'm going to pipe through again and we'll do a bit of deploy here. Deployer. Again, you don't have to do the full name. You can just type mutate if you prefer. XG boost model red. We we'll use the dot pred class variable that comes out the back of it. That's auto generated by that naming conventions, auto generated by the model object itself. We we'll use the XG boost model prop and pred sick prediction sick or with cancer, whatever you want to call it. Deployer, but I'd actually call it sick for now if that's all right. So it relies on that naming convention later on. So we've created two other columns on top of that. We've bind this together from predictions. So we've got every every column from the testing set. We've got every column from the testing fit probs that we looked at earlier, those two variables. We've got the testing fit class, one variable. Then we're going to add another column onto that called XGBoost model predictions as the predict predicted class. XGBoost model prob is the predicted sick label. We're going to select everything, but we're also, you don't have to actually put that, but I like to do it just for convention. We're going to drop the predicted class and the predicted negative because we've created new labels for those. And hopefully, all this works after this. <laughs> Then we use deployer mutate xg boost class custom. So, what just a little caveat for you what it will do with a um, prediction, it will get the raw probability and in tidal models, it sets the boundary of that prediction to 0.5, so 50%. So, anything above 50% will be sick, classified as sick. Anything below will be classified as negative. Sometimes you might want to be a bit more precise in your um, choice of threshold selection. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a custom threshold. If else, XGBoost model prob, which we should have there. So copy that, actually, just for it's the same I'm copy of that and then we're going to say if it's greater than 0 0.7 so 70 percent then call it and these got a match of labels so sick otherwise it's going to be negative so now i'm specifying where i want that cut off to be and then all we're going to do at the end is we're going to oops i need to pipe 
we're going to pipe and we're going to deploy a <coughs> select. And we're going to get rid of that pred thick label. And hopefully that should all work for you. I'll keep that code up on screen for a minute. Seen a message from Jacqueline. Do you want the, the previous code? Did you say Jacqueline? Ah, okay, brilliant. Is Flavia is that Flavia? You give is Flavia giving you everything you need there, Jacqueline? So we're we all up to this point. Have we got that to run? Complaint about missing pred class. I'm just going to check if I typed it right. Right, okay. So that's controlled by this bit here. So your testing fit class, right? So go into that testing fit class label and you should have this dot pred underscore class because that creates that bit creates a separate data frame here. So is that right? Have you got that that step beforehand? Um, yep, yeah, I've got that bit. Have you pulled the workflow fit here? I'll put, I'll put this code in just in case. So if you want to use that code just for now and see if that works, guys, if you're having issues, I'll just put it into the chat to everyone. Thanks, that works for me. I must have made a typo somewhere. Right, mute, Gary. Sorry, guys. Yeah, thanks for reminding me on that. Um, I've got the, let's inspect this predictions label then. So this data frame, sorry, we've got the original test data frame that we've utilized. We've bound onto that. So let's call this our ground truth label. We know what that patient's been predicted as. They are actually sick, right? We've got all these variables that describe why a patient might be sick or not sick. And then at the end, we've got these custom classes that we created. So we've got the prediction out the back of the model. So it's getting that it's sick, that's fine. We've got the probability, so it's a high degree of probability that that patient's sick based on these variables. And even with our custom threshold that we set, so we assumed that this XG boost model prediction is above greater than 50%. With our custom class, we said, let's get it greater than 70%. And you can, you can mess around with that as much as you want. But this custom class is really useful because I don't think the native options in in, in tidy models and carrot are sometimes sensitive enough when you're trying to predict something. And you want to be really certain that, especially with cancer treatments, that the person's got cancer. So you need to be really stringent on where you set that threshold. So we've got a way now to set that threshold in a custom fashion. And that's what we just did through those series of steps. So essentially that's how you'd, for every, even carrot, right? Every carrot model 
always uses predict. You always pass your fit object. You always pass the data. You always look for the probabilities. And then I always create this predictions data frame, which is essentially my testing data, my evaluation data with the predictions. And we know that we've, we know that we've already done K-fold cross-validation on the training data set anyway. So now, hopefully this works because hopefully we've all got the same na label names and stuff. I've, I've pre-populated the fitted logistic regression model to predict on the testing set for you. So can you just run that and see if it works? We've done the same, exactly the same routine twice, basically. Does that work for everyone? And if not, I suggest that you just co you copy that code that I put previously into the comments because that'll have the same variable name conventions. I'm assuming we've all got that. Good. So yeah, what this is going to do is the same routine, but using our logistic regression model, our baseline model that we want to use. So we're going to use the the fit object again of logistic regression. We're going to put it into the, we're going to test the probabilities. So we're going to extract the probs. We're going to get the uh, the class, the actual ground truth label, the predicted label, sorry, of that class. We're going to then add another layer of binding. So we're going to bind to the original prediction data frame that we had before, these additional columns, testing fit probs from our linear uh, logistic regression model and testing logistic regression fit class. And then this step just adds those with different labels together. So after running that, you should have a predictions column with those added on the end as well. So you can see I've got now my XGBoost classes, my logistic regression classes, my probabilities from my logistic regression model. And then based on that, we've done the same logic with our uh, custom threshold assignment so we've got sick across those. So it's, it's doing a good job with that first patient there. Okay. So we've got all that data that we need together. And that's essentially what they do in Kaggle.com tests. So I came, I've done quite a few myself, come within the top 10% of some of these, these methods. What they do is use a whole set of different models. And then what we'd use is the probability label. And we just average over all the different model probabilities to get an ensemble prediction. And that sometimes could be downweighted. So you only use good fitting models, downweight it, and that gives you an overall label that you can then submit to, to win the contest. So yeah, if you're interested, after you go through this tutorial, get on Kaggle, register, have a bit of fun, learn from other people, it's really good. So yeah, we've, we've run that line, cool. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use a package that I built called Confusion Table R. So I am selling some of my own ways here, apologies. We're gonna use, there's a carrots uh, package that carrot function, sorry, called Confusion Table, Confusion Matrix. Uh, but what it does is it gives you in a really messy, messy format that you can't actually work with. So the only, what the Confusion Table R package does is just puts that down into a row based structure. And you'll see that in a second. So we're going to build, first of all, our confusion matrix for our linear regression model. We're going to use confusion tabler and binary class, because we're using a binary class. Our train labels, so what we're passing in is as factor. We need to cast these as factors. So they've got the same number of levels, i.e. I, sick or not sick. We're going to use the logistic regression class custom the one this the greater than 70 percent we use the truth labels as factor so these are the actual testing set labels predictions so what the actual classification is i'm going to use the we're going to set the positive i'm sorry wrong i'm going to set the positive label to sick which is character i'm going to say mode so give me all the stats. 
everything. Okay. And then you get this CM confusion matrix that we're going to export. So you should get that output in a second. So we're using the binary class confusion matrix. We've passed it our predictions from our custom threshold that we set. We know the ground truth label. We're going to predict that the, the uh, positive class is sick. I'm going to use the mode equals to everything. And then finally, we're going to just expose the confusion matrix list item. So it's a list that's got multiple things within it, but we're going to use the confusion matrix for now. So you can see that actually our baseline model doesn't do too, too much of a bad job either. Um, it's obviously more biased to negative predictions. So it's good at predicting when someone's not sick. Um, you can find how sensitive it is to those um, predictions that we need. So sick, sick by looking at the sensitivity. So it's about 73% sensitive. So in terms of that, I wouldn't say that that's deployable because you know we really want to be accurate when we're detecting cancer and that's essentially what sensitivity shows you. Or another way of looking at it, you can look at the how recall focused it is. And specificity is how, in, in terms of the inverse, how well it, it, it does at predicting the negative values. So actually this model is better at predicting whether a patient's not sick of, of thyroid cancer, which might be useful also in some settings. But actually what we're, if the aim of the model was to build it to pick up whether a patient's got thyroid cancer, then yeah, our baseline model needs a bit of improvement. Um, and again, I, I, I'll delve into some of these other, um, other metrics and a couple of blogs that I've done, and I can link those in as well. But overall, our balanced accuracy is about 0.84%. So the trade-off between our negative predictions versus our positive, positive predictions. So, okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to extract... extract our data we're going to get the record level confusion matrix so what how it comes like that is essentially just a list of strings this is the problem that the confusion table package solves is what it does is it puts it into one line lot one observation over 23 variables so it gives you those predictions across a line that then can be stored into a database so what we do in my company is we run lots of different experiments every day and we track these over time. So having it in that format, it's just not going to work. It's not the play ball for me. So what I essentially do is get this data and then pump it into a, a, a database of some, some sort. So a MySQL database or a whatever data database you're using, you can then extract it and push it into there. So we've got this record level confusion matrix and we're just going to create this accuracy frame similar to what we did with the predictions i want to get my accuracy statistics all in one place so this time i'm going to create a tibble just mixing things up i'm going to say the accuracy is the confusion matrix log rec object that we just found and we're going to pick the accuracy stat from there i'm going to get the kappa so how well it performs with future unseen data is the kappa statistics an indication of. We're going to use the kappa precision. And then we need recall as well. You can use sensitivity if you wanted to. But let's do it this way. You can just extract those stats now, like you can with any data frame. Recall. You wouldn't be able to do that without the conf confusion table or package. Not easily anyway. So accuracy frame now. So we've built this accuracy frame for that specific model. We know it's 93% accurate. It's okay, but it's only just better than half in terms of the cap stat. In terms of unseen data, it might not be very performant. Precision and recall. Okay. And then we're going to do the same for the XG boost model, but for the in the absence of time, I think I'm going to copy this over for you guys because we're running out of time. Um, I've obviously put too much content in as per normal. So we're going to 
add this first. I'll just put this in all your um, in the chat. That's the first bit in this this line, and then we're going to create that accuracy frame here. <coughs> Okay, so run that, it's built that accuracy. You can see actually this is much better at identifying sick patients. It's 87% accurate, it's far more accurate than the previous one. Still not great, but far better. And then we're gonna bind that onto our accuracy frame in the next step, and I'll add that code for you now. That's binding it onto the accuracy frame. And you'll see now we've got this. <laughs> I've just run it twice. So we'll get three observations, but you should get two observations. So yeah, you can see that it's more accurate. It's going to be more performant on unseen data. It's really precise and it's recalls good as well. So actually, we'd really want to push that into production as soon as we could, if, if we were happy with that. You can mess around and tweak the thresholds. I think that would be quite good at unseen data and, and, and making accurate estimates. So we're all at that stage where we've we've built that accuracy data frame. Good stuff. Good stuff, good stuff. There's a couple of thumbs up coming in. So I'll, I'll assume we're all good on that, that, that side of things. So the last thing to tell you about is, so we've we've gone through doing some data prep, doing some pre-processing using recipes, a bit of basic EDA, exploratory data analysis. We've done model training, so we've chosen a baseline model and a more perform, high, highly performant model, which is an ensemble model or a, a boosting model. We've set that model up, we've done a high parameter tuning and K-fold cross-validation. We've created the workflows, we've collected the metrics, we've done model eval, we've used the fitted model to predict on the test set, we've used the fitted logistic regression model, we've used the confusion table R package to evaluate these models and collapse them down into records. We've evaluated both models there, and you can evaluate as many models as you want through that routine. You can even create a function to do it. I've just explicitly made us type it twice because I think it just reinforces it. The next thing to do would be, once you've got a model that you want to serialize and push into production, what you do is create an API, which then takes it away from the platform itself and makes it platform agnostic. So you essentially then use JSON requests to pass in the variables into the model. So Vetifer is a really good way of doing that, really spinning up like um, production grade quality R code to be hosted an API really quickly. And I'll go through a few examples here. So first of all, I'm gonna to go to the initializing our Vetiver model object. And one thing I'll add here is I looked at some stack overflow forums because I kept getting an error when I tried to um, host the XGBoost model that we created. And actually it's not supported by Vetiver yet. Um, but they're building that into the framework. And I've put it, I've essentially put a GitHub issue against it for the tidy models team to pick up. So what we're going to use is our baseline model for now, just to show you how you put push a model into production. So we're going to use the VET of a linear regression model. That's what we're going to create a variable named as. We're going to use VET of a model. We use the fit object. That's why it's important that we extract the linear uh, logistic regression fit. I'm going to call it logistic regression model. So we've created our first vetiver model, our vetiver model object. So it knows the model, the model name, what we've just given it, etc. The next step to do is to create, so if you're training multiple versions of this model, if you have this like on a schedule to keep retraining, there's like a training R script, you'd want a way to version um, the accuracy over different training samples. So this again, guys, apologies if I didn't put this on the prerequisites, but we need to install package pins. 
So if you can just install that for me now. Okay. I'm going to create a model board. So it's going to keep track of all our model retraining um, performance. So I'm going to create a temporary board. We have different versions. True. Let's call it T version T. Model board. Then we're just going to say, we're going to pipe through from our model board object. We say Vetiver. Vetiver, and it's going to create a pin. So every time the model's trained, it can keep track of that pin. And that's essentially what pins does. Vet LR model. And we use model board again. Pin versions. And then it's the name of the model that you've created. Logistic regression. Oops. Sorry, it's got to be regression model. So you should have this model board now that's been created. There's a create a new version, right into pin logistic regression model. Create a model card for your published model. This is not, you don't actually have to do it, it's not mandatory. Um, and use the Vetiver RMD template as a place to start. So now we've got this version. So create a version ID. It was created on this time and it's got a hash code. And it will be able to keep track of all these. Every time this model is retrained, it will just add to this, this, this pin board, this model board. So, okay, we've, we've, we've dealt with Vetiver versioning. How do we push it out to a, an API? So uh, this code should be completed for you already. But what we're going to do is I'm going to run it here. So I'm going to bring in Plumber. I'm going to bring in Vetiver. Again, Plumber should be there on the list of prereqs. If it's not, can you install it, please? And then we're going to go Plumber. We're going to write our Vetiver API using our model objects that we just created. And we're going to run it in this browser. So, okay. So what it does is it creates an endpoint for you. So you can see this endpoint now works and you can pass local JSON files to it. So a whole set of essentially production level items that you'd want to predict. We're going to get the health status of the better object. We can see we're online and we're using an API. We're even going to pass a test prediction to it. So we can post. So it knows all the things that you need to pass in that JSON array to this model. So we can try it. And it's predicted the class sick. So it's returned the response from our API. You can see you can fill an example. So you can actually play with different parameters. You can try that. And you get prediction classes back. So it's returning responses from that object. So that's the way that you create an endpoint in Vetiver really quickly. That's only going to create an endpoint on my local machine though. What you really need to do is let's just, I'm just going to comment this out. What you'd really need to do is write a plumber file. So a plumber file is a way to deploy a model object. And I put a lot of, um, I've got a lot of tutorials in the GitHub around this that supports this around how you deploy a plumber web service as a Docker microservice, advanced modeling with carrots. So that's all the stuff I was talking about earlier. Introduction to Docker and using it with R, <coughs> how to use a confusion table R package and all that kind of stuff as well. So you've got a lot of support there if you need it. But it writes this plumber file initially. So we've got this plumber file and you can run it from this plumber file directly. So you store that plumber file in, in the microservice that you want to deploy. And then the next thing you do, and I'm going to have to just copy this in here now, guys, because we've only got two minutes before we the recording stops and we run out of time. So Vetiver writes Docker. That's the model that we use. I'll just ping that in for you. I'm going to write a Docker file that's going to be used with that plumber file and the serialized model to deploy it to an API. So it's going to write this doc Docker file. 
and we've got a Docker file now created in our model objects. So think of a Docker file as a little computer, a microservice that runs for a specific purpose. So for this point, it would be an endpoint. If you you can spin up a database in it, you can spin up websites in endpoints. And to be honest, the whole kit and caboodle. But essentially what it does is it creates the Rocker image. Onto that, it will be a Ubuntu server, a Linux server. It copies, it creates an environment variable. It will run these commands to do the updates on the Linux machine. It copies our virtual environment, our lock file. It's going to run our R script, our R environment. So it's going to create a virtual environment inside there. And then it's going to copy that plumber R file into that. And anything else that's in the model serialization step is going to export, expose port 8000. And then it's going to specify how you run the model as an entry point. So then that can just run on a web service. And then what you do once, if it was on a persistent service, so it's on an endpoint, that's how you'd make a prediction to the website. So port 8080, and you'd use the predict post method to send a prediction forward. And then there's an example of how you pass data through to your prediction endpoint as well. So if we're, these were in production, we wouldn't have seen the labels. We wouldn't know what the label is. We'd have our model serialized with its weights. We'd pass these, these ages in, and then it'd return that value that like you saw earlier, whether a patient was sick or not. Let's run that API again, just to reinforce that point. So it'd return this request for every request that you send to it. And you get a prediction class that we did earlier. And then you get a curl response as well if you're working in Ubuntu. Again, please refer to, if you want to know how to do it step by step from scratch, building the Docker file from scratch, then I can, I can show you how to do that in that, that GitHub tutorial. And then, yeah, if, after you've got this prediction data frame, you just use predict to pass it to your endpoint and use that production patient data frame that we've created there. And that's it, guys. So you've gone, you've covered quite a lot of content today. We've gone from pre-processing, taking the data, building the baseline model, building an XGBoost model, learning a little bit about XGBoost models, more complicated mathematics is here. And then how you then push your model into production. So I hope you found that session informative. Let me know if you need, need anything else from the session. But yeah, it's been great taking you through it today. Thank you.